Welcome to the folks that are joining. We're just going to give it another minute or two for more folks to join, and then we'll kick off. Okay, we're at the top of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and kick off. Welcome everyone to this LF Energy and Wellatech webinar on transforming substation automation with open source solutions featuring Alex Thornton of LF Energy and Yo Center of Wellatech. If anyone has questions during the webinar, you will see in the Zoom interface that there is a Q&A button. If you push that, you can submit a question. When we get to the end of the presentation, we will go through all of those questions in the order that they were received. So again, please make use of that Q&A tool at any time during the webinar. Just be aware that we won't answer the questions until the end. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alex Thornton to kick us off. Thanks, Dan. All right. Uh, yeah, if you could go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to start with uh, setting the context, really providing a, a very brief introduction to open source for those who aren't familiar already. So in its most basic way, uh, open source is a way of collaborating on R&D, right? So if you have multiple organizations that are pursuing similar uh, sorts of solutions, oftentimes, they have to solve the same shared problem before they can go ahead and actually innovate and compete on top of that shared foundation. So rather than having them do that all on their own, open source is a way of collaborating on that shared problem space, developing it together, and then being able to compete on top of it uh, and layer on their own strategic value add, right? And so with open source in particular, this sort of collaboration results in actual working software that anyone can view, change, or share according to a permissive license. And that's really key. So anyone, it's completely public, can view it. Anyone can make a copy and change it, or they can propose a change to the actual core project. Now it's important to understand not anybody can actually implement that change. There's governance and there's ways of, of determining which, which changes actually get incorporated into the shared code base. Um, and then, the code can be shared according to the license and, and license terms vary. Um, and so some, some licenses allow the development of actual proprietary commercial solutions on top of open source. Others are a little bit more restrictive and require that subsequent solutions built on top of that open source core maintain the same license. So next slide, please. So this sort of collaboration results in a myriad of benefits. Uh, and some of them are you accelerate innovation and you reduce individual costs, right? If you're collaborating with peers on this shared problem space, on the shared foundation, each of you has to contribute a little bit less in terms of individual RFP. And you're allowed to, you're, you're able to go faster and further together. Uh, you have improved interoperability through a modular approach. By the nature of this collaboration, you're collaborating with teams and organizations outside of your own, and you need to architect and structure the code in a way that allows concurrent changes and, and scaling in that manner. Uh, you have improved security through complete transparency. You can inspect every single line of code. It's there for you to review. There are no black boxes. 
And then you also have long-term maintainability with a shared common core thriving community around it, right? So you're not necessarily beholden to one single vendor, um, even if one of the contributors ends up, you know, not staying in business or, or not staying involved in the project, you still have a thriving community that can maintain and support the project. Next slide, please. So because of these benefits, open source by now powers nearly all modern technology, right? So there are certainly many, many open source projects that are powering this webinar that we're having right now. If anybody's using an Android phone, Android is a, a open source project on top of Linux, uh, and it's powering the majority of phones and, and a lot of devices in the entire world. It's also in cars, it's in cloud computing, supercomputers, stock exchanges, nuclear submarines. So everything from you know, very niche, high security applications to everyday consumer electronics, open source is literally everywhere. Next slide. And part of the reason that open source is everywhere, not only does it allow for accelerated R&D, but also it allows for uh, very successful businesses, right? So oftentimes there's a virtuous cycle that forms. You have an open source project that leads to a commercial product, and that commercial product leads to profits. And then some of those profits feed back into maintaining, developing that open source project and the cycle continues. Now there, there are different business strategies uh, around actually leading to these profits. Uh, it could be building enterprise products, services, support around the open foundation. There could be other ways that, that businesses take advantage of open source from a revenue perspective. Um, and then the next slide, well, one such example uh, Linux, right? That's a classic open source project. And there's a company called Red Hat that develops enterprise grade Linux on top of uh, that open source core. Uh, and they make money off of that. They generate their profits and they feed that back into the Linux project. So that's just one of dozens or hundreds of examples of businesses being built on top of open source. So the, the most valuable innovative companies in the world invest in open source. So on the left side, you have the, the top contributors to open source. On the right side, you have the uh, most valuable companies in the world by market cap. And there's, there's surprisingly good alignment here, right? Um, so just to double click a little bit on one example, let's take Microsoft and Dan, if you go to the next slide. So Microsoft in 2001, was famous for saying Linux is a cancer. And they, uh, they really tried to squash it. They, they tried legal, legal measures, uh, disinformation campaigns. They really tried to prevent Linux from growing because they saw that as a threat to their proprietary license Windows business. Next slide, yep. And in 2014, they changed their tune. They said, Microsoft loves Linux. And so what, what changed? Like, what, why, did, why did they take this complete 180? And in the next slide, <clears throat> basically it's around customer centricity. They realized that by embracing Linux, they're embracing the needs of their customers. And they realized that the, their customers, their world is heterogeneous, and therefore the business opportunity for Microsoft to offer heterogeneous support. So they adapted their business. They, they got out of the business of purely just trying to make money on Windows licenses. And instead, they, they wanted to optimize for solving their customers' problems. And in doing so, if you go to the next slide, since then, they've, they've increased in value tremendously, right? So their, their stock was relatively flat during the time period that they were trying to squash Linux. And it's because, in my opinion, they weren't very customer-centric. And since then, they've really focused on delivering value to the customer and their stock value has gone through the roof. Another important thing for everybody to be aware of, open source is highly secure uh, because it's transparent, it's inspectable, it's auditable. Uh, so it's often more secure than closed source. Uh, in fact, the Department of Defense in the US has a policy mandating a preference of open source over proprietary solutions. In the next slide, so just because open source can be more secure, doesn't mean that it's secure by default. No software, whether it's proprietary, closed source or open source is secure by default. You need to embrace best practices. 
And there are entities like the Open Source Security Foundation that offers tools, policies, best practices to address cybersecurity risks in open source. And one of the nice things about open source is a vibrant community of contributors can identify and fix bugs typically faster than a single vendor can. Next slide, please. All right, so now you know a little bit more about open source at a high level. Uh, I think everybody here working in, in power and utilities understands that we're undergoing unprecedented changes and complexities to our grid, right? We're moving from centralized to decentralized, load growth is exploding. And so there's a big question, what do we do about this? Next slide, please. So in the past, the way we would try to solve for this complexity is we would try to build physical infrastructure to handle the worst case scenario, right? So more wires, more, more transformers, more substations, more boxes. And that worked really well in an analog world. Um, but as, as time goes on, this approach has a number of drawbacks. One, it costs a lot of money to build things, whether it's the cost of materials are going up, the ability to get things permitted and approved, um, cost of labor, it's just extremely expensive to lay more wires. Uh, it also takes a lot of time. Again, going back to you know legal battles, permitting, uh, procurement, supply chain challenges. And so considering the, the scale of our challenge and the rate of change that the grid is experiencing, this approach of, well, let's just build our way out of the problem. Uh, it's not viable. Next slide. So with FERC order A1 on transmission line ratings, um, one quote from the chairman was, if we're going to meet the needs of the grid of the future while keeping customer rates just and reasonable and maintaining grid reliability, we need to squeeze everything out of our existing grid, right? So it's, it's taking a different mindset of instead of building things as the first step, how do we take what we already have built out and squeeze more capacity out of it. And so that's the approach that we need to pursue going forward. Next slide. So what that means for us is data-driven digital optimization of physical infrastructure. How do we squeeze more capacity out of our physical infrastructure? And digital is really important because as the grid has been changing in complexity, we've also have the rise of IT overlaying on top of the OT. And so digital offers a huge opportunity for us to really optimize the analog world in a way that we weren't previously able to. Slide. In the power and utilities world, uh, there's already a, a rich tradition of collaboration, oftentimes on standards. And this has been incredibly impactful. Uh, it solved a lot of problems and this isn't going anywhere. Um, but there are limitations to the impact that that has, especially around digital technology. So the way that this has historically worked is uh, uh, industry would identify a common problem, a working group would be created, they would collaborate on, okay, how do we solve this problem? And usually they would produce a document that defines the formal standard, right? So, you know, a couple dozen pages in a PDF that says this is how uh, these devices are going to communicate, for example. Next slide. <clears throat> and if we're talking about digital technology, what happens next with that document is each organization that wants to adhere to that standard needs to interpret the standard. Uh, they need to implement the standard. And then after they've done that, then they can layer on their own competitive strategic value add. And so you see the issue here is you go, uh, you have a standard that the industry has agreed upon, but you need to interpret it. Oftentimes there's a little bit of ambiguity in the document. So those interpretations could be slightly different. You have a non-standardized interpretation of the standard. And then after that, each organization needs to invest their own resources in implementing that standard and turning that document into working code. And only then can they layer on their strategic value add. So you, you end up with multiple flavors of implementation and duplication of effort on something that the industry has already agreed is pre-competitive and worth collaborating on. So through open source, in the next slide, 
if we expand the scope of collaboration one step further beyond the document into actual working technology, you can actually collaborate via open source on that interpretation and implementation of the standard, collaborate on that, and then continue to compete on top of that reference implementation, layering on your strategic value add. So this ensures consistency of interpretation of what the standard is, and it also significantly reduces rework uh, and the duplication of effort in implementing that standard. Next slide. So it, to, to summarize what I've discussed so far, right? So the grid needs digital optimization. Open source across many industries, across the most innovative companies in the world is the best way to innovate on digital technology. And putting those two together, every grid stakeholder should have an open source strategy. It's essential as we move forward quickly. Next slide. So diving in more into digital substations. So th the, this is the world of LF energy and digital substations. We have three projects that are relevant. We're gonna talk a, a little bit more about CPAP than the other ones today. So CPAP is that virtualization layer. Uh, Compass is a, a configuration tool for configuring the digital substation systems. And then Fledge Power is a multi-protocol gateway that facilitates the uh, transmission, translation and communication of, of various data. Uh, so I'm going to hand it off to Yos and he'll talk more about CPAP. Perfect. Thank you very much, Alex. Next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit about virtualization first. Um, so, so what is CPAS? Um, CPAS is a hypervisor, uh, which means um, that it is a software that is running on a standard computer hardware. And um, on top of that, you can run operating systems and applications. In the default setup on, on the left side, what you see is that you usually have a computer or server, then you have operating system and application. This operating system is typically Windows or Linux, and then you have a dedicated application like HMI, a gateway, um, or an engineering workstation. If you virtualize, you can share the resources of the computer and least need less computers, which means less boxes within your substation, um, and uh, less, less solutions there. So you have one computer with one physical resources, so the hardware stays the same, but you're sharing these resources between different um, operating systems. So you can have a virtualization layer, and then you can have one operating system, which is, for example, Windows with application, and another operating system, which is Linux application. So what you need to understand is this virtualization can also run um, Windows, which is, uh, well, a proprietary software on the open source project. Next slide, please. If you're looking at different types of hypervisors, well, we have uh, type one hypervisors, type two hypervisors, um, and there are two different things. A type, hype, uh, type one hypervisor is a bare metal hypervisor, which is directly installed on the hardware like an operating system and has direct access to the hardware resources like the CPU, like the RAM, like the storage, and also the network interfaces. Type 2 hypervisors you typically find in, in test environments or if you are running some software for your um, uh, engineering workstation um, is uh, running on top of your operating system. So you have your Windows running and then you have some kind of um, virtual machine that you start in some kind of uh, type two hypervisor, for example, from VMware or any other thing else. Um, if we are looking at type one hypervisors, that is one that we are choosing uh, usually for um, productive environments, uh, for non-test environments, because they have direct access to the resources and then can be much faster and much more reliable. Next slide, please. So now enough about visualization. I think the background is, is quite important, but uh, what's VPAC um, and, and CPAS? CPAS is one component for virtualized protection, automation, and control, or short VPAC system. This means it's not um, in competition to VPAC. It's just one component, and it's a hypervisor. Everything runs on. This is crucial um, because uh, this part um, 
needs to be really vendor independent. That's why open source makes most sense on, on this part because it um, is a foundation for all the other applications. If you have different vendors, um, like for, for uh, applications um, uh, for HMI and GAFE, um, or have redundant uh, um, uh, um, protection algorithms running on those stuff, the underlying hypervisor is always the same. But with CPAS as an open source hypervisor, you can get the same product, probably from two different uh, vendors or similar products. So VPAC totally changes the way um, that those systems are operated and maintained and, and the needs. We're going from a very historical OT to a IT focused system with daily updates and into our IT world. Next slide, please. What's CPAS? Um, CPAS is a virtualization base for multi-vendor apps. It's not in competition to, for example, VPAC Alliance or so, who are defining standards. This is only one component of it. And then CPAS is not um, some kind of product from scratch that's developed from scratch. It's an um, infrastructure as a code project. So that makes it um, possible to configure existing open source projects that are used in thousands of, of applications um, uh, to uh, make it suitable for substations. So it configures complex infrastructure based on open source implementations like KVM, which is open source hypervisor, but also including uh, functionality like PTP or time synchronization and those things. Um, CPAS is built for redundancy and can have multiple nodes that work together and this infrastructure as a code project um, is doing all the configuration for you. Because if you start configuring um, this by hand, it might be, uh, well, take, take weeks or months um, for a Linux expert. So there everything is done, is tested and so on. You can have three, five, seven nodes. Um, you can have an observer monitoring those nodes or can use it without. Um, at the current level, there are two implementations of CPath. One is Debian Linux, um, which is widely used uh, in IT environments. And the other one is Yorktree Linux, which is more on embedded systems. So two uh, major um, Linux implementations are used for CPAS. Next slide, please. CPAS um, is open to the public, so everybody can join the technical discussion round. Um, and you can also see that um, different people are, are joining from different companies. And you can see on the left side that, for example, two of my colleagues, Jan and Daniel, were joining uh, the 6 June um, uh, CPAS TSC, so Technical um, Steering Committee meeting of the project. Uh, but besides that, we have also um, RT, which is a French transmission grid operator. We have NEDIS, which is the French distribution grid operator. We have Schneider Electric, but we also have um, uh, Red Hat, which is the enterprise Linux company. In other TSC meetings, we also find General Electric and many more. So the TSC is open for everybody. Everybody can join. Um, and you just need to register there. I think Alex has some links afterwards uh, to, to give you some information on how to participate. Also, the meeting minutes are open, so you can see whatever happens in every discussion, what the current status is and what the current uh, roadmap is, um, and uh, look into it and read um, the meeting minutes. Next slide, please. So now looking at two voices about CPAS. The one is from Alianda, which is um, uh, the um, distribution grid operator from the Netherlands. And um, they are actively um, um, participating in the Linux Foundation Energy. And um, they realize that um, a real-time platform like, like um, CPAS uh, prevents vendor lock-in on a critical part enhance the flexibility of, of the utility, and most important, improves long-term availability of the software and solution, even if uh, a company is, is purchased by another company um, or the project is stopped and, and so on, some other company can continue this. 
if we're looking at RT, um, uh, Lucien, the deputy director, um, um, RT is, is the French transmission grid operator. It's the largest transmission grid operator in Europe, I think. Um, they are very happy about um, this for the PAC systems, um, and they like the high-performance industrial grade and multi-vendor platform. So two utilities are supporting that and, and also uh, supporting the Linux Foundation um, uh, with this um, uh, budget and, and innovation and feedback. Next one. So what are the benefits for utilities um, uh, in, in uh, participating, creating a secure solution? So first of all, cost savings. Um, all those uh, software is, is Quite expensive if it's um, uh, coming from a vendor. So if you buy a hypervisor, uh, you need to pay license fees and, and those stuff. Um, if you are uh, looking at something based on open source solution, oftentimes um, they can save money. Uh, Alex mentioned that before, that transparency and security. Um, transparency and security means you can look into the source code, you can identify issues, uh, you don't have to trust the vendor that is supplying your software, but you can look into it on, on your own. On the other hand, many other companies are doing that as well. And also um, there are um, uh, scans by the Linux Foundation on a regular basis to check for the current status of security of the project. Then you have the case of flexibility and customization, which is extremely important. If you need some kind of modification and the vendor does not want to do that, you can directly um, get involved in the project. You can go into the TSC and, and talk to the people who take that type of decisions if somebody wants to develop it, or you are putting your own resources into it, pushing your code upwards. And um, if it makes sense for the broader community, they'll accept it and become standard within the project. Then the vendor independence, I mentioned that before, um, you can uh, choose different suppliers. They are all having their solutions based on the same code base. So it's not that you have a totally different solution, uh, but probably um, uh, uh, one which is extremely similar. And the different vendors then offer support packages, um, additional services, and those stuff based on, on, on this. On top of the innovation and long-term support, you have a community, the more uh, utilities taking part, the more vendors taking part, the more feedback is there, uh, the better innovation you get. And then you have the long-term support that um, if utilities decide for this, uh, they will also make sure that the project will run under the umbrella of the Linux Foundation. Next slide, please. So then um, looking at how utilities but also different vendors and, and any other company can contribute. Contribute. First thing is um, to uh, um, have engineers. If you have software developers uh, that know something about um, Linux, or if you're looking at other projects uh, that are, for example, also doing web applications, depending on the project, um, they can directly participate within the project and um, contribute source code. Then there's financial support, which is also uh, important. Um, this can be two different possibilities. Uh, one is um, that you have uh, directly joined the Linux Foundation Energy and, and pay a um, uh, um, yearly amount of money, or that you are um, uh, paying some external software development companies to uh, further develop that project. Um, and you can use all of those stuff, by the way, without joining the Linux Foundation Energy. Um, and you can take part in all the TSC meetings and contribute without uh, uh, joining or doing an official job. Then very important and which can only come from or mainly come from the utilities and that's why participation is, is so important is sharing use cases, what they want to do, um, what possibilities there are within the environment of, of substations uh, running different applications there, um, uh, having HMI, VPAC functions, setups, and, and so on. And of course, exchange with other utilities. And then the last one is uh, demonstrating the market appetite for open solutions um, so that also the vendors are investing more. 
So if you put it in tenders that uh, open source is preferred, uh, it's also quite a big help. Next slide, please. So uh, then there are quite a lot of concerns from utilities and um, uh, there's, for example, the concern about security. Um, uh, that open source software is not secure. Um, I would say it's more secure than closed um, source software, especially if it's under the Linux Foundation um, uh, and the Linux Foundation Energy because it's monitored. Um, and of course, you can also hire a company that just checks the source code and, and uh, um, uh, give you some kind of, of status report, but you cannot do with this closed source. Um, then the support for the product or not, uh, sorry, for the project or not buying a product. Um, this is definitely an issue. If there is no company that is offering professional product, that's an issue. If you don't have a company that offers support, the more um, companies adopt a project and, and show interest, the more companies will um, probably offer a product out of it. We have seen that from Alex before. Uh, that he showed um, uh, the example with, with uh, Linux and Red Hat, so that um, Red Hat builds the enterprise Linux um, on top of the new kernel. And the same is happening also with CPAS. Um, there is uh, a French company, for example, somewhere at Bear Linux, that offer professional support. They're also participating in the development and putting resources in that. Um, there is um, other companies that are looking into this and, and doing that. On top of that uh, stability, that open source software is not stable, uh, but also here you can look into the source code, you understand um, what uh, uh, issues might be there uh, and you can modify. Um, we had um, that with, with uh, some kind of functionality in, in combination uh, with um, uh, an integration where we had to do the integration with, with CPath on open source base and with the closed source at the same time. It was much faster um, to optimize that on, on CPath because we can do it on our own and don't have to wait for the um, company that is doing that. So also stability is probably better on open source and closed source projects. And then we have um, another statement from Bastian from RT, who is also actively participating in the TSC of, of um, so in the technical steering uh, committee meeting of, of CPAS, um, and he really uh, is um, uh, liking CPAS product uh, project for the next gen pack, and um, especially on high performance for virtualization and for the multi vendor support. Next slide, please. And over to you, Alex. All right, thanks. Uh, so as I mentioned before, CPATH has some uh, sister projects within LF Energy, the digital substation ecosystem. So one of those is called Compass. And what this is, is really a, an IEC 61850 SCL configuration tool, right? So uh, really the benefit that it offers, so it's a, it's a multi-vendor, centrally managed, open source, extensible, customizable, SEL editing and managing tool, right? So if you have a heterogeneous system with components from multiple vendors, uh, this is great because it allows you to configure across vendors across that ecosystem. Also, uh, you know, it avoids you having to build this sort of tooling yourself in house or rely on one specific vendor for it. Um, so some of the use cases, I won't go through all of them, right? So specifying requirements for your system, uh, pl grid planning, so converting from SIM formats to 61850, uh, interfacing with other systems such as SCADA, uh, CMDB, grid control, and others. Uh, so this is a really fantastic project also that's being invested in by Aliander, RT, and Sprintines, among others. Um, and, and the idea is to really build out this, again, this shared problem space of how do you configure digital substation systems which is a core problem that every organization deploying these has, uh, and then be able to launch off of that. Next slide. And then another sister project, Fudge Power. Uh, so this is a multi-protocol translation gateway uh, for power systems. So 
there are dozens, if not a, hundreds of different uh, communication protocols uh, that are relevant to uh, the power and utility sector, let alone digital substations. Um, and what Fledge Power do is essentially serves as a translator for all of those different protocols and allows you to get your data from point A to point B effectively in the format that you need it to be in. Um, so it's extremely flexible and scalable. Um, you reduce your maintenance costs because you're, you're building on top of this open source core. Uh, it, it integrates very well with 61850 um, and really just facilitates the, the, modern, the data modernization of all of your systems. Um, so this is one, again, Aliander and RT are quite involved in that, as well as uh, Aviva and Dynamic. Um, and so there's there's a lot of deployments uh, being based on top of Fledge Power. We have a, a case study on our website that uh, talks about how RTE is deploying Fledge Power on their own substations. Next slide. Okay, so uh, hopefully by now you we piqued your interest uh, and you'd like to get a little bit more involved. Uh, so there are a couple of different ways to do so. One, uh, as you said, the, the, the TSC, the Technical Steering Committee, those meetings are open to the public. Anybody can join those. Uh, and you can be a fly on the wall, just an observer, or you can go and you can ask questions to folks who are uh, more familiar with the project development already. So there's a link there to the calendar of upcoming meetings. Feel free to join. We also have a mailing list for the CPATH project. And that's where a lot of communication will go out to the broader community. We have a Slack channel that facilitates slightly more real-time collaborative communication there. Uh, if you're a technology vendor, go ahead and build a commercial product off of CPATH. Uh, the community wants commercial solutions to happen. Uh, so take all of the investment that's gone into this open source core and go and make money off of that. That would be a wonderful thing for the ecosystem. And then as you do, contribute upstream to the development of CPATH, that core project. If you're a utility, you also can invest R&D uh, resources into the project. But also, I know many utilities don't necessarily do their own R&D, and they more procure solutions. Well, in that case, advocate for solutions based on CPATH. And there's an example, RT recently had a, a public tender for solutions based on CPATH. There's a link there if you wanna check it out. Um, and so doing so demonstrates market appetite for this sort of open vendor, uh, vendor neutral, flexible solution such as CPATH. And then last, uh, if you're interested in the LF Energy ecosystem more broadly, uh, come on in and become a member and support the ecosystem. So there's a link there to learn more about that. Back to yours. Thanks. Um, so why is, is Velotech working on um, open source? So um, it's very important that we have open source strategy um, uh, to, to grow together and, and to change the industry. Um, our mission is that we intelligence the power grid for secure and affordable energy. We can only do that um, if we empower our employees all of them to engage and contribute to open source projects um, to, to fulfill our mission. This is crucial for us and um, it's part of our strategy and uh, we are not alone. There are plenty of companies doing uh, that, including um, uh, not only from the energy uh, industry, but uh, including car manufacturers, telecommunication companies, so on. They're very successful with that. So um, we believe that uh, the future is um, based on open source. At the moment, quite a lot of products are already based on Linux, which is open source. And so even more um, uh, advanced applications closer to the use case will be based on open source. And um, I think that uh, we, we have to support that way. We have to go with that way. And this is the only possibility to really, um, well, improve the power grid. Thanks. Back to you, Alex. All right. And to close it out, so uh, LF Energy has its upcoming annual summit, September 5th and 6th in Brussels. And we're going to have one whole day focused on CPATH and associated digital substation projects. So uh, we have a number of presentations that'll, that'll take the entire day uh, of 
one of the days of the conference, uh, many organizations from utilities to vendors, uh, system integrators that are going to be involved and be present. So if you're interested in learning more about the ecosystem, both in terms of the technical projects, but also networking with the stakeholders who are involved, this is a great place to do so. Uh, and then in addition to digital substation content, there's other content tracks around grid operations, grid simulation and modeling, data standards and tooling and open source best practices. So this is really our flagship event each year. Uh, it's really shaping up nicely and I'd encourage everybody to, to check it out and come along. So a link uh, for more information and to sign up is below there. And with that, that's all we have for the content today so we can move on to questions. Perfect. Thank you all. Um, and I do want to just before I jump into the questions, there were some questions added about whether these slides would be available and whether the recording would be available. That is correct. It will. Um, everyone who registered for this webinar will receive an email later today once those are posted. Um, they will actually go on the exact same web page where you registered for this webinar and live there forever. So um, uh, you will have access to that. And that email will also include all of the various links that were included in the presentation here. So keep an eye out for that later today. So in terms of questions, um, the first one that we received was, why can't we use VMware or VirtualBox as the virtualization wrapper? I take this one. Um, you can, and it perfectly works. Um, so uh, VMware is a very good product. The only issue that you might have with VMware is um, that licensing is, is not so easy for utilities and the very long-term support. But on, on the other hand, uh, it's, it's very good that VMware is there and uh, they're leading in, in this um, uh, market as well. So it's, it's a very good product, nothing to say about this. Our customers are using both. Um, so they're using on the one hand VMware, but on the other hand, also um, KVM based Linux based solutions. Perfect. Thank you. Next question Has CPATH VPAC system been used by a transmission utility uh, for transmission substations to replace panels and panels of relay? Uh, as far as I know, uh, um, no transmission grid utility has a VPAC system in a live environment running, but there are demo cases um, where this is done. And as Alex mentioned before, um, RTE, uh, which is the largest transmission grid operator in um, uh, Europe, has uh, uh, ongoing tender, which requires CPAS. Um, so uh, it can be used. We did also real-time testing. We did it also together with vendors, uh, so it can work. Uh, but uh, for VPAC, uh, um, no VPAC system is, is live and running in the transmission substation, to my knowledge. Okay. Next question. Um, does this platform, and uh, this came in when you were talking about CPATH here, so I think it's specific to CPATH. Um, does the platform have built-in cybersecurity features? Um, CPAS has um, Linux built-in cybersecurity features, has additional cybersecurity features uh, where um, the configuration of the Linux system is um, checked if it complies to cybersecurity requirements during the build process and configuration process. So you get also um, some kind of report out of it from every um, change that you do. Then um, on top of that, uh, there are scans for um, uh, cyber security recommendation um, supported by the Linux Foundation. And uh, um, uh, then of course you have uh, the possibility to also run commercial software on it because it's a hypervisor so you can virtualize, for example, a firewall, um, for example, from vendor like Fortinet or um, virtualized IDS system um, from uh, Tragos or Nozomi uh, and have additional uh, layer of security depending on, on your requirements and needs. Perfect. Um, the next one is more of a comment, but um, it says, I am a bit concerned about bureaucracy impeding updates to bring in new features. I, I suspect this has to do with open source governance. 
Alex, Alex, do you want to respond to that? Sure. Yeah, I, I I'm not sure if I completely understand uh, the statement, um, but I guess to to speak a little bit to the governance of the project. So there's there's a technical steering committee for the project, of which there are certain organizations and people appointed to be formal decision makers about what code gets incorporated. Uh, again, you know, open source doesn't work as a free for all. If anybody can get their change included. Um, it goes through a, a governance project, which ensures security and stability and, and proper architecture. Uh, that said, uh, we do strive to keep this very low bureaucracy. Anybody can come to the TSC meetings. Uh, anybody can make a pull request to propose a change. Anybody can join the Slack community. So it is very open. Uh, and I would say the community is, is quite um uh, quite quick to respond to questions that are raised and, and incorporate those as, uh, you know, kind of uh, changes into the approach or, or the roadmap. So uh, if there are specific questions or concerns, um, you know, feel free to reach out to the TSC of CPAP directly, or you can also reach out to, to me or, or staff at Linux Foundation Energy and we'll get those addressed. Perfect. Um, what are some licensing restrictions to keep in mind while using CPATH or other LF Energy projects? Sure. So I'll, I'll take that one also. So CPATH is a Apache 2.0, which is a very uh, permissive license. So it allows for building closed source proprietary software on top of the open source co core. Uh, each open source project within LF Energy and generally globally has its own license that determines what you're allowed to do with it. Uh, we generally like the more permissive license, but we don't exclusively use those. So what I'd encourage you to do is uh, if you're interested in a specific project, whether it's CPATH or others, the license is always included with the code to define what you're allowed to do with it. Um, and there are easy ways to, to go and understand, okay, well, what does this license mean for me and my own goals? Um, I went to the GitHub site where for Compass. Um, it has several projects listed. Uh, is there a help file to see how each project fits together? Yeah, so for Compass and you know, other projects as well, oftentimes there are many repos that make up the project in total. Uh, Compass does have a wiki that's associated with it. So if you go to not the, the GitHub, uh, the GitHub project page, but also the LF Energy Compass page. There's a link to a wiki that talks a little bit more about architecture and how everything fits together. Um, if there, if the question also is referring to how does Compass fit in with CPATH and Fledge Power, uh, that's something that we're working on. So we're recently spinning up a, a digital substation special interest group that's meant to facilitate collaboration and, and shared architecture between these related projects. So that's not something we have right now, but a plan to have in the near future. Perfect. This next one uh, might be a little technical and I'm, I'm not sure if you folks will be able to answer it, but we'll try anyway. <laughs> Can you use OpenSCD to compare two separate SCD files, not CIDs? So I'm not sure. I think that would be a great question for uh, the Compass and OpenSCD community, and I'm sure they'd be able to answer that quickly, yes or no. All right. Is there any sort of Google Summer of Code-like funding plan to support and promote individuals to contribute? So we don't have anything like that planned. I think genuinely what we're trying to cultivate here is, is really uh, more of a company sponsored ecosystem of, you know, aligning the goals of these projects with the business goals of utilities and vendors. Uh, so trying to build out, for example, commercial contributions from, uh, from vendors that are trying to build a business around these projects more so than, uh, funding individuals and, and things along those lines. Next, I'm working on a, on a, Free com trade files reader, uh, which is not open source, um, but I want to find people to collaborate. Can that be done through LF Energy? So I'm not sure what what com trade is, but if it's a if it's a project related to energy, 
uh, we could be a place to collaborate with it. So I'd encourage you to reach out to LF Energy and uh, we can talk about it. Yeah, or probably go to the um, uh, Compass TSC meeting and uh, they can ask those questions and see probably it, it fits inside as well. Um, if every vendor follows IEC 61850 standards, then any SCL configuration tool should work. Not sure what's different as mentioned in one of the slides. You want to take that, Yoff? Well, I, I can take that. Uh, so as Alex mentioned at, at the beginning, everybody's following the standards. Uh, but the interpretation of standards is um, different. So real interoperability is sometimes a little bit tricky if uh, one vendor also delivers um, uh, the, the tool for the configuration, it's a hurdle for multi-vendor systems. Um, if you're looking at Compass, for example, you can add your own modules um, uh, um, for some kind of slide modifications, or if you have something special inside from special configuration and extend the project uh, based on your needs, uh, or you take um, uh, your needs uh, to the TSC or, or contribute the code, and it probably goes into the standard so that you have a lot of different options to do. Anything to add, Alex? No, uh, I think you nailed it. Awesome. Um, the next one I can probably speak to briefly, which is, uh, in my opinion, there's not a lot of educational materials on Compass. What do you plan to do about that? Um, I will note, if you go to the Linux Foundation Energy's YouTube, um, we do have a series of some video tutorials around Compass that the community has put together, but we're always looking to do more. Um, and so we do, you know, rely on the subject matter experts in the community to help us uh, compile those sorts of materials as they're the ones who are the experts on the technology itself. Um, but yes, it's a, a point well taken and we certainly would like to have more documentation and trading type materials, not only for Compass, but all our projects. And that's something we're looking at on an ongoing basis. Um, next, since open source comes in a form of software, can the software function as control and monitoring of substation equipment. I'm not sure if I understand the question. Alex, yeah. you understand yeah, the question? Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure either. Okay, maybe the next one. Okay, we'll skip that one then. Uh, and whoever asked that, if you want to clarify, feel free to submit again. Um, how does CPATH virtualization handle real-time constraints required for protection applications? Let me take that very well. <laughs> so what, what we are doing is uh, we are testing um, uh, CPATH on our hardware platforms, and, and there will also be, um, uh, there's a lab in planning uh, where different type of hardware platforms um, are used um, to test and validate if this works well. And um, there are, for example, from the, I'm, I'm also a member of the steering committee of the VTEC Alliance, and there are some kind of values defined, and we can meet those values with CPAS, and it's, it's perfectly working. CPAS is KVM based, so every Linux um, uh, system uh, that is tuned for real time can handle those things. Great. Um, next one, this will be for Alex. Does LF Energy have a charter or mission statement? And assuming so, does it have sustainability goals? And how does CPATH play into that? Sure. Yeah. So our mission is to accelerate the energy transition by building open source communities around uh, open technology and standards. Uh, and so as, as you know, speaking to sustainability, so energy transition is decarbonizing our energy systems and all of the changes and impacts uh, that are associated with that. So uh, we're very much uh, oriented around decarbonizing our energy system and sustainability. And CPAP fits into that because in, in, you know, going back to some of my previous content around, you know, we, we need to digitize the grid in order to squeeze more capacity out of it. 
CPATH fits very cleanly into that of digital substations are key components in squeezing more capacity out of the grid and really making those substation components much more dynamic. Um, so CPATH is, I would say, a critical foundation piece of that evolution and, and part of LF Energy's mission. Perfect. And then um, last question is, um, is there a sandbox environment to add simulated units and get a feel for Compass or CPAP before deploying in a physical test environment? Um, let me answer that for Compass. So for Compass, um, uh, you have an uh, online version where you can just uh, log in and, and see um, how the software is. But of course, if you want to have uh, some kind of um, system that uh, does not change and where um, everything that, that you configure is always staying there, you need to set it up on your own. For CPAS, there is no uh, such a system. But if you're interested in it, um, uh, you can get in uh, touch uh, uh, with us uh, and uh, we can check what we can do uh, together with you. And I'll just add a little bit to that. It is something that um, we have been discussing uh, at LF Energy more broadly, um, having this sort of simulation environment. It's not something that's currently available for any of our projects, but um, you're not the first one to ask. And so it is something that uh, in the future, we would like to find a way to, um, to offer. Uh, and then related to the question before that, um, Christoph from Sound Warfare Linux actually added a comment. Um, uh, I would like to add a comment to the last question on the fact that CPATH has been built and made to meet the RT requirements of running VPAC. Um, and that's the main difference between CPATH and VMware. And RT stands for real time. Perfect. Um, and Christoph also asked us to highlight that, uh, again, at LF Energy Summit, in addition to all of the various um, uh, 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 sessions that Alex already outlined, there is going to also be a CPAP meetup for the community to um, be able to get together and collaborate in person at the event. That brings us to the end of our questions. So uh, at this time, I'll thank all the um, our participants for joining and listening in and to our two panelists for a fantastic presentation. Um, again, you all should receive an email later today with a link to the recording, um, relevant URLs and the slide deck. So thank you all again for joining. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan, for organizing. And thank you, Alex. And of course, yeah, thank you for joining. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.